All right, are you ready? Let's get our Bibles out. Let's go to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Is that right? Yes, yes Acts chapter 14. We're down to verse 8. Paul has, Paul and uh, Barnabas have moved to, uh, they, they got thrown out of Antioch. Uh, then they wound up in Iconium. They got thrown out of there. And, uh, well, they didn't get thrown, they left there, I think. Uh, and then they've, uh, they've now gone to Lystra, and uh, then they're going to Derby. So uh, let's pick up with that, and we're in verse 8. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, who never had walked. Three things about this man that Paul, put, or the, the writer of Acts tells us. He was impotent in his feet. That meant his feet didn't work. Just feet didn't work. Crippled from his mother's womb, and I'm assuming that's because of his feet or legs, whatever it is, he hasn't been able to walk and had never walked. And it's important that he gives us that information for about what's to happen. Because when God does something, when God shows up, God doesn't fool around, does he? And boy, did he hear. The same, the man who we've just listed about, the, the same man, the same heard Paul speak. So evidently, even though he couldn't walk, he was placed in a position where he could hear Paul as he spoke. And Paul, steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped, jumped. He leaped and walked. Now, you have to know that's, what a miracle. Here's a man who's never walked. You know, somebody goes through a stroke or has walked before and they have an injury. It takes them a while to get their balance and get everything working in the right direction. Not this guy. He jumps up and And a man who's laid cripple all his life. You know, his, bo his bones, his, his muscles and all, they're, they're not formed. They're not... They're not where he can jump. Even if he could walk, he'd need a walker, wouldn't he? But not when Jesus heals, amen? Right. You know, I just love that about Jesus. You know, these healers today, they don't have a thing. Man, I tell you, if they could, if they could heal like Jesus was, that'd be something. Of course, they can't because they don't have the healing power that Jesus had. But he heals. And when he heals, he heals completely and permanently and without any. Nobody could question this. It was of God. It had to be of God. And again, this is a miracle of Paul because he's an apostle. Don't forget, apostles had these special gifts that God gave them for this very reason. It drew attention to him. It also showed that he had a power that they'd never seen before. And it came from God. Of course, he's quick to tell them that. It came from God. And... Uh, so this is Paul as he heals this lame man, and what a powerful thing it is. And I always say this about, I read this, and it says, uh, because I say this all the time, you go out throughout the, the New Testament, you find Jesus healing, and uh, very seldom does Jesus ever ask them, do they have faith to be healed? Um, in fact, there's times when people are healed that there's not even a mention of faith as a part of it. They're completely non-believers, and they're healed. So we see that throughout. So these so-called healers we have today, if you go to their services and expect to be healed and you don't get healed, it's not their fault. It's your fault because you don't have enough faith. But that's never the case. But look at this guy. It said Paul understood or Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed. He didn't ask him. He just perceived that this man was ready to be healed. And man, he didn't ask him, do you think you have enough faith to be healed? I mean, do you think you, do you, think you can drum up enough faith so that you can get God to do this? Can you do that? You know, No, nope, didn't have to do that. This man had faith, and all it took was for Paul to make a statement, stand upright on my feet. And boy, did he ever. And when the people, verse 11, saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, do you say that? Come on. And then like me. Y'all didn't know I knew Lyconium, did you? Let me tell you, that's what it sounded like to Paul because Paul didn't know what they had said. And, and I, that's kind of cool when you think about it. He didn't know what they said because they're going to do some things. He's going to have to figure out what's going on. 
But let me tell you the story behind this story. They said, the, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So they're looking at Paul and Barnabas, and they're declaring in their language that these two men are gods that have come. The folklore is that Zeus and Hermes had visited before, but no one would uh, allow them any food or lodging. And so um, this old peasant named Philemon or Philemon and his wife, Baucus, took them, took them in. The rest of the city was destroyed by a flood, but not this house. So Philemon and Baucus, I'm trying to read my, my real small writing. Their house then was turned into, miraculously, into a temple. And they were the priest and priestess of that temple. When they died, they say that there was two, they became two stately trees in front of the temple. Don't you love mythology? So the people of Lystra, they didn't want to miss this again. So this is why they responded like they did. They're quick to put deity on these guys. And they want to pull them in and give them everything they can. Because they don't want to miss this thing. Verse 12. And they call Barnabas Zeus and Paul Mercurius, Mer Mercurius or that's Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter... Zeus, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So they don't know what's going on because they're talking to them in this language. And Paul and Barbers are going, what's going on? I don't know. And all of a sudden they're putting flowers on their head. And they're calling them. They've got all this going, right? Y'all just love it when I talk Spanish or English or Lyconium, excuse me. I'm talking Lyconium. Uh, that is pure Lyconium. I can tell you that it is straight. If you were, if you were from Lyconia, you would be able to understand me, I promise. Liar. There I am. Ruby's watching. Ruby, I'm sorry I lied. Uh, anyway. They, but they don't know what's going on. They're trying to figure this out. Something's not quite right. They can tell something's not quite right. And so, uh, verse 14, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes. So when they figured this out, they didn't stop and go, you know what? Maybe we, you know, we have done a lot of good things. Why don't, let's see what they give us, you know? We, we, you know, we deserve it. Right? I mean, come on, Barnabas. We've, we've, we've been, man, we got ran out of our, uh, Antioch. We got ran out of Iconium. Here we are in Lystra. Don't you think it's about time that we get some, get some retribution, that we get some kind of, you know, well, it'll be all right. Surely it'll be all right. Let's just see what they give us before we back them off. No, not Paul and Silas. That's not going to happen. They back them off real quick. They rent their clothes. They tear their clothes. And ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities, this false religion, unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So Paul took the opportunity to just not only tell them not to do that, he gave them an opportunity to preach to them, right? Told them about God, told them about the Lord. He's their witness. Now let's go back for just a second. Verse 14 says, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas was not one of the 12 apostles. In fact, some question whether or not Paul is one of the twelve. I feel like he is, but that's, we're not going to argue that point. But Barnabas wasn't one of the twelve apostles. So you have to understand the word apostle means sent one. It's a missionary term. 
So even though they use the term apostle here, we're not talking about one of the select 12, although Paul is one, Barnabas wasn't, but they are, he is included because he is uh, a sent one. He's a missionary that's sent out. And um, the verse 15 says, Sirs, why do ye these things? Probably they didn't know the language, but now they knew this was wrong. This false religion and what they were about to do. They're about to sacrifice and they brought the oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done so. I can see them. Old Paul, the old rough preacher, you know. You ever watch those movies and they're going to make somebody a deity? What do they do? They make a, they make a, a, a crown or they make a, out, of, out of flowers and stuff. I can see Paul going, get that, get that away from me. What, what are you doing, you know? Don't put that on my head, you know. Uh, old rough Paul and Barnabas, of course, he's the encourager. I imagine he would say, well, thank you. Thank you very much, you know. But uh, then they realized that they were being made gods. So they, they, they straightened them out. In verse 17, nevertheless, he left him, they left not himself without witness. And you know what his witness is? Look what Paul tells. What's his witness? It's not, he doesn't mention them. What does he mention? Creation. You see that? And you go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 8. We know that he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And we know that it's in his creation where we see God. That's where people see God. Uh, I was talking to a fellow the other day, we, we were talking about how do, how do people who've never heard the word of God, maybe never heard the word Jesus, how do they get saved? Because we know the Bible says, God, then God's word says that every person has the opportunity to be saved. There's nobody left out. So how do they get saved? Well, you know, I think it's through nature. I think they see through creation, this God, God reveals himself. Maybe a lot more easily than he does to us because we have the word of God and we've heard the name Jesus. But to these who haven't, but through his creation, they can look at the stars in heaven, the sun, the moon. That's what they usually worship because they realize it's something special. And, uh, but it's of God. Verse 18. And all these sayings scarce restrain they the people that had not done sacrifice under them. So even though Paul's words were impactful, it almost, it barely restrained, scarcely restrained the, the people that they had not done sacrifice. It just barely stopped them from following through. So it may not have convinced them of their need to turn from false gods, but at least they knew Paul and Barnabas were not the gods they had thought they were. Verse 19. And there came thither, uh-oh, certain Jews, uh-oh, from Antioch and Iconium. Richard asked me the other day when we went to Iconium, he says, do you think these guys are the ones that followed them? And I said, I didn't think so. I thought these were probably some from, from Iconium. Well, now we know that it's both. You know, they just kept, they kept ganging up on him. They kept just following him around, you know. Well, I was going to say like our president, like they do our president. You know, they just kind of gang up. You get one or two on them. Then the next thing you know, you got five or ten. And the next thing you know, you got 20, 25, 30. Well, here we got them doing that to Paul and Barnabas. And they have come following them all the way from these other cities who persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he'd been dead. These are those who came in from another city. Why in the world am I doing that? Again, and I got new batteries. There's something else going on. Um, these, are, these are those who came in from other cities. It doesn't say that the people, of course, I believe the, the people list are probably got involved with it. Some of them did. The mob mentality. They say, oh, they're throwing rocks. Let me throw a rock, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, but they are the ones that Paul, pulled ball, Paul out and stoned him, drew him out of the city, and supposing he had been dead. Now, it's interesting. It says, supposing he'd been dead. This was an ongoing practice for Paul in places where he's been stoned and left for dead. And um, the way Paul talks about this sometimes, you almost think that may, he may have died, and then God wasn't through with him, brought him back. But 
he was left for dead outside the city. Verse 20, Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Well, I, you got to appreciate Paul. You know, he didn't take off and run. He, he got, he was stoned, left for dead. Everybody's standing around, what do we do now? And all of a sudden the rocks move and Paul stands up and says, we've got to go back into the city. And don't you know the people that left him for dead when they saw him, they're going, wait, 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 wait a minute. Didn't we just kill him? I mean, I don't know what's going on here. But he comes back into Lystra, but he doesn't stay. He cuts out the next morning. He stays just long enough, and then he cuts out the next morning to go to Derby. I believe he's got some healing that's got to take place there. But he goes to Derby the next day, um, about 40 miles. Pretty good little walk for somebody who just got stoned. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, to Derby, and had taught many, they had had men... <laughs> I, you just got to appreciate Paul. I, I got to stop for a second because I'm just picturing this guy. You know, I, I mean, he's got he's got blown out eyeball or he's got uh, cranial problems. He's got sores and bumps all over him. I mean, these are not little pebbles. I mean, they they stone him. They, they're trying to kill him. It's not something that's light or, you know, and, and here he is. He walks all the way to Derby. He gets there and I, I mean, they've got him cleaned up a little bit. But don't you imagine he's pretty beat up looking? You know, I, I just get a picture of a rocky after he's been beat up by one of the like like the russian you know i mean things are out of place things are not the way it ought to be and and he's up there and he's comes into town and he starts preaching to him you know but as he preaches you know what it revives him it revives him because he sees the spirit of god work and he sees people their lives are being changed and he said he taught many and they were and, and he preached the gospel of that city and had taught many and they they came to christ and there was a response and man things were going great and so what do they do they returned again to lystra i would have i would have gone another direction wouldn't you yeah. i would have found some way to bypass lystra i would have gone around it or something Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me go back and just see if they want to stone me again. Yeah, let me, let me check this out. Uh, but, they go back. but the truth is, the reason they go back is because there's a group of people there that are starting a church. There's work that's got to be done. And you can't let the, the, the evil of the world keep you from doing what God's called you to do. And so he goes back there. Not only there, but where else he goes? He goes to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. The places these other people came from. He goes, he's followed. You know, they're probably going home. Thinking, yeah, we took care of him. And they turn around and say, who's that? Oh, that's Paul, Paul following them, you know, back to their homes. And, uh, but he's, he's got work to do. These churches, that's why they've started these churches and people are being saved. But they've been, they've been run out of town. So there was still some work that had to be done. Uh, to start a church is not something that's easy. It takes, it takes work. And I started a church in California. We were there for three years. And the first year you're there, you just, I'm telling you what, you just think it's never going to get off the ground. You're, you're, you don't have a building. You don't have, a, you don't have anything, you know. Um, we had some sound equipment, and we found a little uh, daycare center that we could rent on Sundays. But uh, we'd have to go in on Saturday night and take everything down, and we took pictures of everything so we know where to put it back. We take everything down, and then we'd come in and put our chairs up and put our sound equipment up. And then on Sunday night, we'd have prayer meeting, and then we would just we would break it back down and put it back like it was. We did that for over a year, and uh, but it's hard. It's not easy. And I'm talking about in America. You know, can you imagine in a place where they've never heard the gospel, never heard about Jesus? Uh, and those that are from Judaism that you were from, they are posing you. It would be really rough. And then, to, then once you start it, once you get a group of people, you, you can't just leave them. You've got to stay there and establish elders. And you've got to establish preachers and deacons. And you've got to set up the, the, the structure so that they can operate as a church. And so there was a lot of work to be done. Paul is going back through there and I think doing a speed course on church growth and church building and what have you so uh, but he's back in those cities and um, 
because there had to be some uh, work done there. Verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples. That's what I'm talking about. They strengthening, reaffirming the doctrine with these who would, had turned their lives over to Christ and exhorting them, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So he goes back and he said, guys, look. He said, you got, he's, he's encouraging them. He says, you've got to stay at the task. Don't let anything stop you. And don't be afraid of persecution. And here he is standing there maybe with some scars and stuff, uh, open wounds. And he said, don't let this keep you from doing, being the church that God wants you to be. Don't let persecution, don't let the world stop you. That's a good message for us today. Amen. 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 You know, the whole world has gone crazy over us. More so now than I've ever imagined. Um, the shutting down of churches and the, the restrictions they're trying to put on churches and pastors and, and leaders and, you know, threatening jail time and all the You know, who would have ever thought that we would have that going on? But we can't let that keep us from being the church God called us to be. That's right. You got to stay at the task. And you say, well, what if it gets really bad? You stay at the task. Right. You know, the, the Lord said that there would be persecution, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to a child of God. If you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. That's what he says. And so we expect that. But Brother Jim, what if it costs us our life? Well, it might. Go to heaven. Praise yeah, the Lord. Go to heaven. Well, that's right. Going straight to heaven was, well, why worry about that? But listen, we're to stay at the task, not waiting for death, but stay at the task is anxious to do what God's doing and watching him do the miracles that he's going to do through all of this. There's going to be great things. Do what? Bring people with us. Bring people with us. Yeah, bring people to church. Bring people to the Lord. Talk to people about Jesus. We're getting close to the end. It's no time for us to relax. It's time for us to, to get on board, to really move and make things happen. This uh, election that's coming up, both sides, the Republicans and Democrats, they, they realize that the time's going short. And I mean, it's intensified, isn't it? I mean, it's just everybody, everything is intensified. It's just getting, uh, it's getting worse and worse and better and better. I don't know how you guys will say, but, you know, it's just getting, they're just really pressing to the last, this last hundred days. They're pressing for that election. Well, listen, we've got something far more important than an election that we're pressing for. And we ought to be pressing as hard as they are to share the gospel and preach the gospel and make sure people hear the word of God. So this is where Paul is. He understood it was important he goes back. And when he's there, he presses them. He encourages them. And he tells them, don't you let persecution keep you from, uh, from being who you're supposed to be. Verse 19. And, there, uh, and I'm sorry, where am I at? 24. 24 thank you. I'm so glad y'all keep up. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. So they're heading home. They're, go they're retracing their tracks. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they had to go to Perga. They went down to Attilia, um, Perga. That's where they had sailed to from Cyprus. Felt that Paul felt the need to return since he did not get to evangelize there. Although he came through that area, he didn't get a chance to evangelize. He just kind of passed through. And it's as if Paul says, before we go home, let's go to this one last home. Let's go to this one last place. I've got to preach the gospel there. And then finally down to Atelia where the seaport was. Verse 26, and then sailed. Now we have list some history. They sailed to Antioch. That's Syria. That's, that's the home base where they left from. Uh, Antioch of Syria. From whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. Now, isn't that great? They did exactly what they were asked to do. And that was to go into these areas, promoting the gospel, sharing the gospel, finding out what's going on, and bringing it back to them. These missionaries... And now they're going to come back and they're going to give a missionary report. You've been to a church where the missionary comes and gives his report? You know, it's, 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 it's exciting and interesting. Sometimes people come and they go, oh, missionary, oh, they're going to go to sleep. Man, listen, when these missionaries come and they have these great stories about things that God has done in these foreign lands as, as God's using them, man, we ought to be excited for that. And seeing that happen and knowing that we had a part of it in some way. 
And when they were come, had gathered the church together, and they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. So this is, this is a missions conference that turns into a teaching conference. And don't you, man, wouldn't it have been fun to hear Paul's stories? Uh, wouldn't it have been exciting to hear those stories? And wouldn't it encourage you, you know, if you're going through a little bit of persecution, a little bit of this going on, you got your feelings hurt at this kind of thing, to have Paul get up and talk about, man, I, I got stoned there and listen, and I'm not talking about with alcohol. I'm talking about they stoned me with rocks and left me for dead out there in the middle of the road. I'm telling you, blood was gushing out of every pore of my body. I, it was bad. I'm telling you, it was bad. In fact, it was so bad, everybody thought I was dead when I popped up out of them rocks. You should have seen the other disciples. Their eyeballs popped out of their head because I was alive and I was ready to go back into Lystra. Now, you're sitting there and you're a poor little weak Christian that's afraid you're going to get your feelings hurt because somebody doesn't want to hear the gospel from you. Wouldn't that stir you up? Woo! I mean. Let's go to chapter 15. Verse 1. And certain men, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Oh my goodness. A whole other problem has now popped up. Here Paul and Barnabas are preaching and sharing and everything is going well. And all of a sudden, don't you know, somebody gets up and said, now wait just a minute. I love this when missionaries come back and they say, we had a thousand saved. And you look, at, you look at her and go, yeah, right. I wonder if they really got saved. How many of those really got saved, missionary? I mean, really, I mean, do you know they really got saved? I mean, were they all baby Christians? Are they babies like four or five years old? And that's what you're telling them. Yes, you know, that's the way people love throw cold water. Well, here's cold water being thrown on all that Paul and, si uh, Paul and Barnabas had done. Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, the fact they came from Judea is a problem because that is where the homeland, that's where the home church is. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, that is where they came from. These are ones that were taught and, and, and what you would think were taught by the apostles of the, the church there in Jerusalem. And so they had some clout as they came and so as they're preaching people are saying well huh i don't think that's quite what paul's been preaching but these guys came from the home church you know they i wonder if they know more than paul does i kind of wondered about this now what they're preaching is legalism they were called judaizers they're teaching a need to be jewish before you can be a christian you got to be a jew first before you can be a Christian. So they were talking about the circumcision, the manner of Moses, or you cannot be saved. You've got to be a Jew, or you can't be saved. Verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension dis disputation with them, I bet they didn't. I bet that was a humdinger of a, 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 a church meeting or a business meeting, don't you imagine? When they're arguing over this. They waxed boldly. Thank you. Yeah, amen, brother. They waxed boldly. They, they, they were telling them how it was. Now, for you, now, here's the thing I want you to think about. For you and I, if the Apostle Paul showed up, you would expect me to sit down, wouldn't you? I would sit down. Because Paul, we know, is proven. He's a man of God. We know that he's going he's gonna to be instrumental in writing 13 of the 27 New Testament books. He has some clout. I mean, when he says this is doctrine, I'd be the last person to argue with him, right? But isn't it interesting now, because see, he hadn't written those books yet, and he's just started his ministry, and isn't it interesting that these people stand up and say, what Paul's teaching y'all is not right, and the people are saying, oh, well, wait a minute. I wonder if that's true. And I wonder how that affected Paul. I know how it affects me when somebody questions whether or not I'm teaching the Word of God or not. I, I want to go, what's wrong with you? Uh, but uh, they, uh, Paul understands their question. And even though he has no small dissension 
and disputation with them, um, he is going to allow God to direct this situation, and he does. Look what God does. They, the brethren, those who were from Judea and also the people of Antioch, they determined that Paul and Bar the, those of the church there, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and the elders about this question. We need to go to the home church. We, we need to go back to the home church. We need to check with the other apostles, Paul. We're not sure that you've got this right. This is a little bit far-fetched for us, and I think maybe you might be wrong on this. And uh, so we think we need to go back and ask the, uh, the leadership there at the church as whether or not this is right or not. And... Uh, And, and, you know, it's interesting that this church at Antioch, Antioch had already, had already uh, come to the place where there was this um, um, organization. That's the word I'm looking for. Organization of a church to where they had the ability to question and talk about doctrinal issues like that. A lot of churches don't have that. They don't have ability to do that. Um, they they had a they had probably had some elders they may have had some pastors they may have had some deacons but they they had a they had an organization where they could make this decision and Paul and Barnabas would abide by it as would these others let's go ask we'll accept what they say okay well, great let's go ask so that's what's going to happen and being brought on their way by the church the church at Antioch they passed through Phoenix Phoenix and Samaria. Understand these to be areas that were filled with the converts of Philip and Peter, and primarily Gentiles. And they were declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And of course, they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Well, yeah, because here's an area that uh, is mixed with Jews and Gentiles, and these are Gentiles have been saved, and they are starting their church, and they're beginning to grow a little bit. And you know, the Gentiles are still kind of on the outs a little bit with the Jews. They're not quite accepted like you may think they would be. And here now, as he passes through, and they start talking about all the Gentiles that have been saved now up in these other area. Uh, Iconium, Antioch, Lystra, Derby, Gentiles. And uh, as he comes back and he's sharing that, and they get excited because the Gentiles are being saved. This God has truly opened up the door for the Gentiles. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders and declared all things that God had done with them. Oh, but... But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying... Now, notice this. Pharisees which believed, they're saved. But they've got, some, they've got another argument. Saying that it was needful for, to, to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So now it wasn't about salvation, but it was about them being circumcised in order to fulfill the law. To abide by the law. That's why I believe these were saved Pharisees. They still were Pharisees, but they were saved, they, which believed. And they said, this is the problem. Now, I'm going to finish verse 6. We're going to stop there. And the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And let me give you three scenarios that they're going to be considering. Number one, what they brought with them from Antioch, that someone had to be circumcised in order to be saved. That's legalism. That you've got to do some work in order to be saved. That's legalism. Secondly, we've got the fact of the Pharisees that says you have to be circumcised to keep the law. It's not for salvation, to keep the law. They were putting the law major, which we understand, well, Paul deals with that in Romans. But they, they, that was their thing. It wasn't about salvation, it was about keeping the law. And then we have those that are circumcised uh, they, they, they want it, circumcision to be done away with altogether. There's no need for it. Get rid of it. It's old, it's old Testament. It's old law. Let's get rid of it. We don't need to do that at all. So now then they've got to deal with that issue. And so it's not going to be something that's going to be quick and easy. There's going to be some real debate going on here. Now, as I close, I want you to think about, and I'll bring this back when we come back next time, 
I want you to think about the church at Jerusalem, all they've been through, everything that's going on. But remember, the Lord, as far as we know, gave no instruction on how to organize a church. It all happens as it happens. Now, I think God was in complete control of that. But as, as, you begin, as we began Acts, we began to read through, the, 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 the leadership were just reacting to whatever was happening. People being saved, great, let's get them baptized. Uh, got a problem up here with these group of uh, widows. Uh, let's choose out seven men and get them to go up there and take care of them so that we can stay busy here. Uh, we've got some food issues with some of our folks that run out of food. Let's make sure let's gather that up and let's take it. Uh, we've got some needs for taking care of some people financially. Let's, let's have people just bring what they will to the church. Let's, but that's the way it happened. It wasn't like they had a book, you know, they could go to and say, well, you know, here's what, uh, here's what, here's what the book says. Here's what our policy procedure manual says. They don't have that, you know, and they don't even have this. You realize that the, the majority of this hasn't been written yet. So they don't even have this. And, that's, and they put so much trust in those elders to make the right decision. You know, trusting that they were going to be moved by God as they listened, as they argued, as they talked, as they debated. They were going to figure out what God wanted them to do. And that's what's going to happen as we see this. And it's exciting to see how that come together. And that's, that's, I think that's the plan for God's church now. Now, we have the instruction book. It's completed. We have how they started a church. We see the organization of elders and deacons and pastors and all the rest. We, we, we know what that is. We know what the qualifications are because God's word gives it to us. But they were in the infant stages of the church. And so they were learning as they went. And uh, for them, this was a major issue. And you can imagine, it's not something small. This is a major issue. This is major doctrine. You know, what if they get it wrong? What if all of a sudden, we've all got to go get circumcised? I'm not in favor of that. <laughs> you, know, what, you know, it wouldn't be right. But, but as we look at this and watch and see how this transpires, it's going to be awesome to see how they find the right answer. And then how they deal with it. And as they find the right answer, how the church, all the church, responds in a positive way. That's a good thing. This is exactly right. They, don't, they, they, they realize it was the right thing. So I, I, I think it's exciting what we're seeing as we're looking at the church being birthed here. All right. I'm going to put my stop sign there. And I'll know where to start next time. All right, any question, comment, or thought? I'll try to answer your question if I can. When he stoned Paul, what happened to Barnabas? As far as I know, he's with those other guys standing around him, you know, going, hey, what happened, you know? They were after Paul. They, I don't know that they, you know, he, he was the main talker. That's why they called him uh, Hermes. He was the main speaker, they said, that is why they named him that. And uh, so he was the main talker. So he was the antagonist, I guess you'd say. And so that's who they went after I would imagine. Good question. Anybody else? That's good. Hayward said that's good. That's a good point that, that the reason the Lord didn't give all the instruction for the church was because, this is the way I heard you, is because the Holy Spirit was going to be the guide in putting this together. And there would be no dispute between Jesus and the Holy Spirit in how that was done. And uh, that's what's missing, in, I think, in a lot of churches is we, we're so busy programming the church for success that the Holy Spirit very seldom gets the opportunity to direct the church in a way that he would choose because success to the Holy Spirit doesn't look anything like success that's being promoted in church growth anymore. Right. I don't think. That's my opinion. Though. And I'll stick to it, I guess. All right. All right. Is that it? Good points. Well, let's stand and be dismissed word of prayer. As I finish the prayer, if you will, just take a minute to clean around you. And uh, if you want to, if you brought a mask, put it on as you leave. Be good. And uh, uh, if not, keep your six-foot distance. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for what you've taught us now in the Word. And pray as we leave, Father, we'll, we'll learn that trust of the Holy Spirit to guide, direct, to empower us like he did Paul, Barnabas, even in the midst of persecution that we don't get frustrated to the point of wanting to quit. But Father, we recognize the need for those kinds of things to keep us on our knees before you, trusting you. Thank you, Lord, for the evidence of the Holy Spirit and the work of the beginning of the church and how it, it gives us as a church the, uh, the instruction to trust him. And in doing that, then we can have a church that is one that is built upon what you want. We love you and thank you for our folks. Bless now as we leave and go our different directions. And bring us back safely Sunday, Lord, as we enjoy our time with the Southern Plainsmen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, don't forget the Southern